Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all joining us live across the United States and in China. I am Steve Orlands, president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I am pleased to welcome audiences from 100 venues in 44 states and three venues in China to our 12th annual China Town Hall. Our program comes at a critical time in the relations between our two countries. While our presidents, Trump and Xi, initially seemed to forge a good relationship that is now being challenged. In its national security and defense strategies, the Trump administration branded China, along with Russia, a strategic competitor and a revisionist power. It has excluded China from RIMPAC, imposed tariffs on 250 billion of Chinese exports, limited Chinese investment, restricted visas for several categories of Chinese, and debated ending Chinese student visas to the United States. Last Thursday, Vice President Pence claimed China is using a whole-of-government approach to advance its influence and benefit its interests in the United States. For its part, China can, continues to restrict investments in many areas, impose tariff and non-tariff barriers on U.S. imports, appropriate U.S. intellectual property, block U.S. internet and media companies from entering China's market, and violate international law in its activities in the South China Seas. In my 41 years working on Sino-American relations, I cannot recall a time when the future has been so uncertain. Yet as the two most important powers in the world, cooperation between China and the United States is essential for dealing with critical transnational issues, including non-proliferation, public health, climate change, trade and investment, terrorism, and global peace and stability. This is why we are fortunate to have Secretary Condoleezza Rice join us for this program. As Secretary of State from 2005 to 2009 and National Security Advisor from 2001 to 2005, both under President George W. Bush, Secretary Rice helped formulate U.S. policy towards China, met frequently with China's top leaders, and worked with Chinese counterparts on numerous global issues. Secretary Rice, it is an honor to have you with us thank here tonight. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would also like to thank our partners at all 100 venues, the largest number we have ever had. Let me thank our speakers as well, a veritable who's who of China experts in America. We also thank the Star Foundation, United Airlines, our media partner, SupChina, and finally, our very dedicated staff at the National Committee. We are now accepting questions submitted via Twitter. Please tweet us your questions using the hashtag CTH18 or tagging NCUSCR. Let me begin with a few of my own questions for Secretary Rice. But before I do, I just want to note that this year marks the 30th anniversary of the first time you participated in a National Committee program. In the summer of 1988, you were an associate professor of political science at Stanford University and joined a Sino-Soviet American study group to China and the Soviet Union. Now, of course, you're back at Stanford holding three prestigious positions and having had an incredibly distinguished and path-breaking path career in between. During the, we're delighted that three decades after we first got to know you, you've agreed again to share your knowledge and wisdom with us. Thank you again for being here. Let me start with the questions. First, from 2001 to 2009, obviously National Security Advisor and then Secretary of State, what are the lessons kind of from that period that would be applicable today? Well, first of all, let me say thank you to the National Committee, uh, which has been a stalwart in helping in the understanding between our countries. And um, I was indeed a young faculty member uh, on one of the trips, in fact, my very first trip to China. 
And I want to start there because uh, what I really uh, understood when I came into office in 2001 is that China is uh, a power that has risen very quickly. Uh, I was in China in 1988, and the streets of Beijing were a few horse carts, a few automobiles, and a lot of bicycles. That's not Beijing today. And so this is a country that has, gris has uh, risen and grown rapidly, lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, uh, and is a force on the world stage. And so I think during our time, we understood that we had differences. We had differences about human rights, about religious freedom. Uh, we were beginning to have some differences about uh, military policy. But we also understood that there were some things that we needed to cooperate uh, in. For instance, uh, China is a major factor in the international economy. No one can really imagine international growth that is sustained without Chinese economic growth. We needed cooperation on uh, North Korea so that we could uh, begin to do something to roll back uh, Pyongyang's uh, nuclear programs. And so um, I learned how difficult it is sometimes to get the nuance in U.S.-China relations and to work on the cooperative elements uh, while trying to deal with the fact that you will have differences and being honest about those differences. 9-11 and the war in Iraq occurred during your tenure as National Security Advisor first and then Secretary of, of State. How was China's behavior uh, during those crises in American foreign policy? Well, the crisis in 9-11, of course, uh, really did uh, expose that there were only two sides to be on. That was with the terrorist or against the terrorist, uh, to quote President George W. Bush. And I will have to say that we had actually very good cooperation uh, with China in getting, for instance, to the Security Council resolutions on terrorist financing so that we could track terrorist financing and, in fact, therefore, track terrorists. Uh, we had very good cooperation when uh, there was need for sharing of information. Nobody wanted to be subject to terrorist attack, and nobody wanted another country to be subject to terrorist attack. This really was the terrorist against the international order, and I think China played uh, an important role. I think that at the time, uh, China still talked a great deal about non-interference in the affairs of others, and so perhaps uh, was not on board with uh, some of the things that we did, although they were very helpful and supportive uh, of our actions in Afghanistan, which were directly related to al-Qaeda. But I would say that uh, the relationship with China was actually very good during that period of time, and uh, we got very good cooperation. Mm -hmm. Do you think the national def security strategy and the national defense strategy branding China as a, as a strategic competitor rather than focusing on the cooperative elements that you've uh, laid out will make it more difficult to cooperate in the United Nations and on terrorism in the future? Well, I don't think it has to. Uh, the fact is we are, in some sense, strategic competitors. It doesn't mean that competition has to be conflictual. And uh, we compete in the international uh, economy. Uh, increasingly, uh, we are competing for leadership in certain areas of technology. I think we need to, in a sense, uh, take the venom out of the word competitor. Mm -hmm. And let's say that uh, competitors uh, compete within certain rules. So what should those rules be? First and foremost in the international economy, let's try to compete in a way in which we don't take unfair advantage of an international trading system that is supposed to be open and free. Uh, let's try to compete in a way uh, that recognizes the importance of intellectual property and therefore respects uh, the sanctity of intellectual property rights. Uh, let's try to compete in a way that does not bring our military forces into such close, uh, such course, uh, close conflict uh, that we can have an accident. The first actual crisis in the Bush administration was in April of 2001 on Hanan Island when a Chinese pilot da uh, downed an American uh, reconnaissance craft. Our 
crew was held hostage for seven days. It was a very, very tense time. We eventually solved that problem. But you know, that was an accident. Nobody intended that to happen. It was a pilot barrel rolling in international airspace. So as we compete, let's do it in a way that we don't bring our military forces into uh, close contact with one another and end up in a confrontation that we didn't uh, intend. And so we can compete. We're going to compete. Let's cooperate where we can. Let's compete where we must. Let's have our differences where we must. But let's try to do it in a way uh, that makes the world safer and more prosperous. With that view, what did you think of Vice President Pence's speech last Thursday? Well, I thought the Vice President laid out a, uh, a very uh, compelling and, in fact, a comprehensive case about uh, the difficulties that have been growing between the United States and China. And, and let's be clear, this didn't start with the Trump administration. Uh, issues about intellectual property go back for several administrations. I can remember having long conversations with President Hu Jintao about uh, the need to protect intellectual property. Uh, in the Obama administration, there were concerns about what was going on in the South China Sea. Um, I actually think the way that uh, China 2020, 2025 was posed, it was posed as a kind of uh, challenge to the United States uh, for technological superiority. So these things have been building for a while, and I thought the vice president laid out that case. Now the question is, what do we do about it? And uh, the United States has many, many strengths from which to take on these challenges in a way uh, that acknowledges China's role in the world. I'll give you an example. I actually thought when China came up with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, we should have said, that's a great idea. We need infrastructure. Let's start in Afghanistan. Instead, we somehow felt that it was a challenge to the institutions that we had created. So if we can find those places where we can help to channel some of China's desire for uh, an enhanced role in international politics, which it is going to have as a rising power, that will be a way to make this competition not one that is dangerous. Uh, in the North Korean situation, nobody is going to benefit from a North Korean regime that is as closed and opaque as that regime, having a nuclear weapon capable of reaching the United States. Nobody benefits from that. And so that's an area where we need and should seek the cooperation of China, and China should want to cooperate. So I thought the vice president laid out uh, the case. It's a case that's been building for some time. And now the question is, what do we do about it? You're kind of, when AIIB was proposed, obviously the United States decided, the Asian yeah. Infrastructure Inve In Investment Bank was proposed, the United States decided not to join. Is it possible we'll see a reversal of that position and the United States will join? Well, I don't know if that's even being considered. It's certainly something I would, uh, would favor because, uh, from what I know of the, the bank, and I've met its leadership, it's actually trying to uh, be transparent. It's trying to work by international standards. Uh, it sought a lot of advice from the World Bank and indeed from American private banks. And as I said, we need infrastructure around the world. And as long as it's transparently done, um, I think this could be a place for cooperation. Um, now, there are some elements that are uh, efforts at infrastructure through One Belt, One Road that look uh, somewhat different than a uh, kind of transparent uh, international effort. And we can get into that if you would like. But the uh, AAIB, I would, uh, I would hope the United States yep. might reconsider. And it's living by global kind of yeah, standards. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to. The, trying yes, to do that, yes. They clearly were doing that. Um, during the Bush administration, you're very strong supporters of, uh, or strong supporters of maintaining the one China policy. Yes. And when Chen Shui-bian tried to, to kind of change that, uh, President Bush said, you know, no unilateral changes mm -hmm. in, in this policy. Mm -hmm. Is the Trump administration drifting away from that? Oh, I don't think the Trump administration is drifting on this issue. I think that, in fact, uh, the one China policy is in place. It's likely to remain in place. <clears throat> Let's remember, that the United States um, has certain obligations to Taiwan. 
And uh, the Bush administration carried those out. I remember uh, our uh, arms package to Taiwan was not so favorably viewed by the China, Chinese in Never 2001. Is. Never is. But we have an obligation to help Taiwan defend itself. Taiwan is also a democracy. Taiwan is also a market economy. And I've always hoped that China would begin to see that uh, we could open up international space for Taiwan, um, not in recognition of Taiwan as a separate country, but in recognizing that Taiwan is a special entity. So, for instance, the World Health Organization. Uh, this is the kind of thing where, uh, when you have an epidemic like SARS, uh, from a, a, a few years ago, you would want Taiwan to be uh, a part of that because it's right in, in uh, harm's way for something like the SARS uh, epidemic. Um, we have Taiwan sitting at the table at the Asia Pacific Economic Council. Uh, it's never hurt anyone. So let's open up space for this democratic market-based economy, which, by the way, has very tight economic relations with, uh, with China. And um, I think that uh, there's plenty of room to do that without uh, violating, in any sense, the one China policy. Uh, last question for me, then I'm going to go to the, the, uh, our viewers around the country. Um, you were kind of there at the creation of the six-party talks, obviously know a lot yes. about what's gone on in North Korea. Do you think we're making progress vis-a-vis -vis North Korea today? I do think that uh, we're making some progress. Uh, Secretary Pompeo was uh, just in. Uh, Pyongyang again. Um, and I, I think that the president and Kim Jong-un met and they sort of set in motion uh, the possibility of getting some good things done to start to deal with the North Korean danger. I, for instance, will hope that you'll get inspectors in relatively quickly so that you can begin to verify uh, any uh, declarations about what weapons have been created. Um, I would hope that uh, we would uh, very soon uh, from the North Koreans uh, begin to see that they are not going to move again toward testing or the like. That would make everyone safer. I think that's something that China favors. Uh, the advantage of the six-party talks was we had everybody at the table at the same time. We had Japan and Russia and China, South Korea, North Korea, the United States. Uh, but we're doing this more bilaterally now. Uh, South Korea is taking a bigger role. And uh, yes, I think they have a chance to uh, get some things done, but you're going to have to be patient uh, because uh, this isn't going to be done overnight. Start with audience questions. Emily from Worcester, Mass. asks, if the trade war continues to escalate, what will happen to the 2.6 million jobs in the United States that are supported by U.S.-China trade? Well, let's uh, first talk about the term trade war. Uh, what we have so far is that we've had the administration impose some tariffs. We've had China do counter tariffs, and there have been uh, tariffs and increased threats of, of greater tariffs. Uh, I'm a free trader, right? So I don't like tariff, uh, tariff uh, back and forth very much. I think that it doesn't serve anybody. I believe that the international economy is better at when it's trading uh, freely and more openly. But uh, let's ask what is it that we're trying to achieve and see if we and China together can get to that without continuing this, this imposition of tariffs. And uh, I think on the American side, uh, there is a sense that after being uh, admitted to the WTO, probably ahead of schedule, because everybody believed that the Chinese economy would be better inside the tent, so to speak, as outside of it, that uh, there has been some disappointment in China's uh, response and China's behavior in the international system. I mentioned intellectual property rights. I, there are whole segments of the Chinese economy that are closed to foreign investment. Uh, if you talk to American CEOs, they will tell you about the joint ventures that they were forced into only to lose their intellectual property to the joint venture. And so there is work that could be done to change some of the structural issues that are leading to some of these trade imbalances. But as we do that, what do we do about the U.S. companies that are making tens of billions of dollars of profit in China? Well, and don't we have to, f doesn't 
vice president's speech not focus at all on that and the exports that are generated from the United States to China as a result of those businesses? There, there being is in no China? doubt. There is no doubt that uh, the uh, access of American companies, particularly for manufacturing and the ability to manufacture in China, although China is no longer the low cost provider of labor, so some of this is shifting to other places. There's no doubt that there's been some benefit to the U.S. economy, as I said. The international economy needs Chinese economic growth, so let's be very clear about that. But there's increasing frustration that despite those numbers, there are uh, trade practices that, are, that have to be addressed. And I actually think that I hear from my Chinese friends, and I do consider myself a friend of China, I hear from my Chinese friends, well, we, we don't know what it is we're being asked to do. Well, Think about ways to protect intellectual property more effectively. Think about ways to open segments of the economy to, uh, for instance, financial services. Uh, don't hide behind the fact that these are state-owned enterprises. Uh, why can't you have U.S. investment in some of these? And then I think you'll see a different atmosphere uh, in the United States. As a free trader, you can't like tariffs. So what tools does the Trump administration have to achieve these goals? And this is, by the yeah. way, not my question. This is Jack from Santa Barbara yeah, who, well, who asked this. Yes, and it's a good question because uh, what the administration has said is our only tool is tariffs. And so we're going to use tariffs and use tariffs until we get a response. I think we have many other uh, tools at our disposal. Uh, one is uh, that we do have the ability to look more closely at investment here, if investment can, if Chinese investment here, if American investment cannot be done there. I don't want to get into a tit for tat, but uh, China is very interested in investing uh, internationally. Well, in order to do that, you're going to have to open up some of the investment rules and just ask for reciprocity. You don't have to have tariffs, just ask for reciprocity. And if you don't get reciprocity, now you know that you're in a different kind of uh, economic relationship. So you think the principle should be reciprocity, and if, they, if there is no reciprocity, then the United States takes an action I, which... I believe we're going to have to press for reciprocity now. But China is now, uh, I know that there's the language of still being a developing economy, but China is a mature economy at this point. It's an important economy. We need it to succeed. It will succeed better if it is more open. And so I would argue to my, my Chinese friends that uh, doing away with some of these barriers will actually improve uh, the prospects for the Chinese economy. Look at how well the Chinese large companies are doing, the Alibabas, the Tencents. Look at how well they're doing. They could be doing very well internationally as well, not just in the Chinese market, under different circumstances. So I think there's a win-win here, but it's going to require reciprocity. Emily from Miami, Florida asks, how should the United States convince China and the Chinese people that it is not inhibiting China's development? And I think what she's getting at here is a view in China today that uh, with the national uh, strategic strategy, the defense strategy, and now Vice President Pence's speech, there's a view that we're seeking to contain and inhibit China's development. How do we persuade them otherwise? I would say to, to China, in part, your development has been because the United States created an open international economy after World War II, and you, after Deng Xiaoping, took tremendous advantage of it. Uh, if the United States had wanted to protect and to stop China's economic growth, we would not have advocated for China to be in the WTO. If we had wanted to stop China's economic growth, we would not uh, train uh, Chinese students and see them go back to China. It's, it's not the American way to try to inhibit somebody else's development. Uh, when we see China in the uh, China 2025, say, however, we're going to do whatever it takes to surpass the United States in quantum computing and AI, you're going to get a response from the United States. My response from the United States would be, just you try. Because we've always been better at innovation than anybody else in the world, and so we're going to leapfrog you, and we're going to do it by keeping our universities open and bring your students over here and let them learn. We're still going to win. Uh, that race. Well, which was my, one of my questions was, do you think there's any chance, the Financial Times reported that the Trump administration debated 
uh, ending Chinese student visas to no. the United States. I, I would be, think I would be completely opposed to doing so. I'm a university professor. I want to train the best and brightest from all over the world. And I believe that everybody benefits if they are well trained and they go back to improve economic life uh, for their countries and for their people. So I would be fundamentally opposed to that, and even to restrictions on what Chinese students can study. But the United States has to show a certain confidence in our system. And our system is one that believes in openness and innovation. If I could get the U.S. government to do one thing, I would increase the budget of the National Science Foundation so that we can do more in fundamental research. And uh, I'll, I like our odds uh, in the race for, for frontier technologies. Which Tom from Tampa asks, right on this, Tampa, Florida asks, is Chinese innovation a threat to the United States? Well, Chinese innovation uh, to the United States is certainly, a ch uh, Chinese uh, innovation is certainly a challenge because uh, some of the uh, technologies in which China is innovating, if put to military use, uh, could begin to erode uh, American uh, military uh, power and advantages, and uh, that's what people worry about. That's why you see the Defense Department taking such a hard line on certain kinds of investments, on certain kinds of technologies. Um, but I think that, uh, again, our best response has to be to continue to innovate and to con continue to leapfrog. Uh, the United States has been through a few of these um, episodes. Uh, we went through the episode where the Soviet Union actually did beat us into space, but ultimately not to the moon. Uh, we went through it with Japan, where uh, METI, the Ministry for, uh, for Trade, uh, for Investment and Trade, was going to outdo us, and they were buying everything from Pebble Beach to Rockefeller Center, and they were going to and we, we did just fine. Um, I think that uh, China would be well served to think about um, how this language around what they're doing in terms of frontier technologies is affecting the environment um, in the United States. Uh, I don't have a problem for China rush, uh, racing as hard and fast as it can toward innovation in frontier technologies. Every country should have that right. And I hope Germany races and I hope Japan races and that they all do. But uh, don't, don't do it in a way that sounds as if you're doing it uh, to supplant the United States and to use it in confrontation. Yeah. Well, Paul from Colorado Springs asks, do you believe the policy of preventing China's rise in AI is the right one? Presently, all U.S. efforts in the private sector are rife with duplication and lack coordination at the national level. Should the U.S. government be concentrating on developing and supporting a more comprehensive national AI policy? Well, I don't mind having a comprehensive national AI policy, but then I hope that once it's issued, we leave it to the private sector to actually do what it wants to do. Um, the idea that you drive innovation from the top in some sense is so contrary to the experiences that we've had. Where have the greatest breakthroughs come in the last 50 years? They've come out of garages in Palo Alto, right? They've come out of, uh, of buildings in uh, New York. They've come out of university labs in Austin, Texas. It is exactly the decentralization of the American innovation uh, approach that has led, to borrow a Chinese phrase, many flowers bloom, and then we get the, to pick the best of them. Um, I would actually warn uh, that anybody who tries to do this as a single point of failure, we in the government know what is going to work, and so we're going to direct investment to that, is pay, playing a very faulty game. I'll tell you a little funny story about this. So Bill Perry, um, who was uh, Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering in the early 80s and later on Secretary of Defense, was asked, he tells this story, was asked uh, on a Senate, um, in Senate hearings uh, very early, sort of 1981 or so, uh, 19, 1979 or so, did he think there was a future for personal computing? And he said, I don't have any idea why anybody would ever want a personal computer. Right? <laughs> so if the undersecretary for research and engineering, who's one of the smartest people I know, didn't see it coming, 
That's how innovation happens. Right. You can't see it coming from the top. And so, uh, with all due respect to the Chinese, um, I'll, I'll keep our rather decentralized system. Let's talk a little more about uh, Vice President Pence's speech. Um, quoting from it, he said, Previous administrations all but ignored China's actions, and in many cases, they abetted them. I assume he wasn't applying. I don't think he, he was talking about, about us. Clearly, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't mean Secretary Rice in that line. <laughs> but did previous administrations ignore China, Chinese actions? I mean, the Obama administration and its yeah. discussions on cyber, yeah. the but representations there, there is on— always a tendency when you are in the White House to think that everything that you're doing is new. Um, it's, it's not. Um, and I think that if you look back, there has been now a long history of trying to get China to deal with intellectual property trying, uh, rights, trying to get China to uh, open its markets. Um, the, the problem is that we are now at a place where these frustrations have accumulated over time. And so when you have the vice president say that, perhaps what, he's, for, what he is uh, is focusing on is the fact that these frustrations have been accumulating over time and we've not been able to get a uh, positive Chinese response on them. And in that sense, uh, the, that sense, the, the ball has been in China's court. Let's go to a, um, something you mentioned early in your, in your introduction, your answer to the first question, which is human rights. And, We've had press reports, and Robert from New York asks, what can the U.S. do to protect the Uyghur Muslims yeah. whom are being placed by news reports, at least, in re-education camps? Yes, this is really an awful development. Um, the, the Uyghurs, uh, you know, relatively small Muslim minority uh, within China, um, have largely been mistreated for uh, a very, very long time. And now, according to reports, those, uh, that mistreatment is reaching kind of epic proportions. I would hope that the Chinese government, uh, respecting the fact that this is Chinese territory, but that they would want to be more transparent about what's actually going in on there. Why not have the International Red Cross come and see what is going on with the Uyghurs? so that people can advocate for these people who are basically very helpless. Whenever I went to China, I raised human rights. I raised religious freedom uh, with the Chinese. And I did it in a respectful way. But the U.S. has certain values about the treatment of human beings. And we're not going to step back from our values. We're not going to step back from uh, advocating for and for being uh, a voice of the voiceless. And in a case like this, I think that China is uh, really sullying its international reputation by having this sort of thing happen. You know, and, and if China's going to play a bigger role in the international system, um, you have to recognize, too, that what happened with the head of Interpol recently, right. where he just sort of suddenly disappeared, and then we find he's back at home in charges after being promoted to an international position of, of high authority. So as a country that is emerging as a great power and that wants to play a bigger role, uh, some of this has to have more daylight, more light of day, more transparency, uh, or that role is never going to materialize. Mm -hmm. Lily from Oxford, which I, since we don't have a venue in Oxford, yes. England, I assume she's on the, the, the watching this on the internet. Uh, Trump recently signed FIRMA, the Foreign Investment Risk Review yeah. Modernization Act, which expands national security screening of foreign investment. How has the balance between openness to foreign investment and protection of national security changed within the last, since you served in government? Yes, I think it has been changing pretty rapidly uh, because uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, when it was set up, was initially uh, just to look at mergers and acquisitions, and it was really supposed to be from the perspective of does this have an impact on national security. And it, because the Treasury Secretary heads it, the idea was to make very clear to people that this was not protectionism. It wasn't an effort to, to stop uh, mergers and acquisitions. We just wanted to be sure that the mergers and acquisitions uh, didn't undermine American national security. The number of, um, of mergers and acquisitions that have been rejected has gone up 
pretty dramatically, and uh, those related to China especially. And now with Firma, uh, we are looking not just at mergers and acquisitions, but potentially investment into certain companies and certain technologies. Now, given that uh, there's a kind of worldwide investment community, particularly in the venture world, I think this is actually going to be pretty hard to implement. We'll see how it's implemented. Slifius is not really a body that's set up to do this uh, very well. And so we will see. But um, I, th I think that the idea that you are going to look at every investment that might have a national security impact, um, it seems to me a bit overwhelming for the government to, think, to do that. Do you think there's a risk that we're, we're tilting too far to the security and that will devalue assets of all American uh, companies well, I think, and, I think and there's divert a, investment? I think there's a risk. I don't think we're there yet. And we have to see how this plays out. If it really is only about investment in cases that are pretty clear, then maybe we'll be okay. But I'm, I am concerned that uh, this is a place that we could be uh, moving into an area uh, with unintended consequences. Uh, Matthias from Middletown, Connecticut. In what ways can liberal nations, such as the U.S., encourage an increasingly powerful China to abandon the use of force and integrate into the system of international law? Well, the, the questioner asks a, a very uh, important uh, question because he speaks of liberal nations, and let me change that to liberal order. Uh, after World War II, a sense that we would have an international economy that was not zero-sum game, um, a sense that we would um, advocate for uh, free trade, uh, a sense that we would integrate more closely, and from that would come liberalization of countries, and a sense that there were international laws and there was an international order that we would all respect. And uh, China decided to take a place in that international order uh, with Deng Xiaoping's decision to open up and then accession to the WTO and so on and so on. And as I've said a couple of times, uh, there's great disappointment that it hasn't really completely played out in the way that it should. And for instance, when you get an, uh, a ruling, ICJ ruling, on uh, the South China Sea and China says we simply don't acknowledge that, or they don't even bother to say they don't acknowledge it, really. Right. Uh, you, you wonder about uh, the dedication to rules-based. So I think the thing to say to China is that there are kind of two ways that great powers act in the international system. One is that they act only on their own interest in the narrowest sense of their own interest. And everybody else, you'll just have to get out of our way. The other is a sense that you have a broader definition of national interest, which includes the idea that if others are prosperous, if others uh, enjoy peace, you're better off too. And the United States hasn't always been perfect in that regard, but I think for the most part, when you look at the international trading system that we set up, the United States probably had 60% of the world's GDP after World War II. Most of the world was flattened. Did we try to protect it? No, we opened up an international free trading system. We've tried to advocate for people who are struggling for democracy or freedoms or human rights, even when it hasn't been so clearly in our national interest. And so um, I would say to China, if you're going to play on the, the big stage, try to do it in a way that uh, makes the world more prosperous and peaceful for everybody, not just for China. I mean, that raises, of course, the, the question of use of force and abiding um, by international law raises the question of kind of the balance in perspective. As you said, the United States is not perfect. And China's use of force has, since 79, been pretty minimal. Mm -hmm. In fact, they don't use force. They may act in violation of international law, but they don't take over islands where they're people and kill them and stuff. And the United States, you know, the UN has certainly felt we have acted in violation of international law. Well, the, uh, yeah, it's yes. in, when you were in government, well, in fact, yes, I think. Yes, exactly. But I guess then if it's in violation of international law to overthrow a brutal dictator yeah. 
who we thought was getting weapons of mass destruction and has been a cancer in the Middle East and had been sanctioned before and was under 17 different Security Council resolutions uh, for the kind of act, if it was against international law to overthrow the Taliban, which was executing women in, in uh, stadiums that were built for it by the United Nations uh, so that we could clear that terrorist safe haven that attacked us in 9-11, uh, well, you know, then maybe international law wasn't in the right place. Well, that's what the Chinese would say about the South China Sea yeah, ruling, the so that, the that, South, it's, that the it's South a China, sovereign, you know, their no, argument. We, I don't agree with it. Yeah, I saw them on but, record. But let me just say, yeah. this wasn't a ruling uh, that the United States could not act in anticipatory self-defense in Afghanistan. Uh, international law allows— the Secretary General said in, it was, in Afghanistan, international, well, home, I mean, right, international right. law is, uh, and recognizes anticipatory self-defense. We can have an argument about whether Resolution 1441 passed by the UN Security Council and saying that Iraq would suffer uh, serious consequences because it was a threat to international peace and security, what that actually meant. But the United States actually did go to the UN, and the United States actually did debate it in the UN. What I would say about the South China Sea is, okay, let's debate it in the UN. If China would like to do that, I think we'd be all for it. Madeline from Minnesota asks, how should the U.S. and China cooperate to combat the global threat of climate change? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, China has um, a lot of reasons to uh, deal with uh, pollution in China. You can't breathe in Beijing. And it has become a social issue in China. It's become a political issue in China. Uh, because uh, there was a, the, the Chinese government was not actually accurately reflecting what the uh, particulates were in the um, in the atmosphere. They were not accurately uh, reflecting what the air quality was. And uh, people started using their own little app to find out what the air quality actually was. And by the way, it wasn't very good. And so China has reason to shut down coal-fired plants, although it's still building them. It has reason. Uh, to be concerned about what's happening uh, to the environment. So does the United States. But the United States, uh, international treaties or no, has been a leader in cleaning up its environment. Uh, just ask people who lived in Los Angeles in the 1960s what uh, the air quality was like then. Um, we're going to get to uh, dealing with climate change by three, the three E's. We have to have economic growth. No one is going to sacrifice economic growth. But we have to do it in an environmentally sustainable way. And we're going to have to do it in a way that gives us a different energy mix than we have now. And some of the getting to the different energy mix is in technology and innovation again. And I've been uh, a fan of certain um, proposals out there that, for instance, if you want to trade in, in, a, in innovative technologies uh, that would help climate change, they ought to be tariff-free. So I think there are a lot of ways that we could cooperate on the technological side, on the innovation side, because that's ultimately how we're going to get an energy mix that helps us to do both economic growth and environmental sustainability. Ming from Nashville, Tennessee. Americans are not nearly as interested in learning about China as the Chinese are interested in learning about the United States. How can we encourage Americans to learn more about China, its culture, history, and people? Well, I have an awful lot of students who are fascinated with China and uh, trying to learn that incredibly difficult language and, and the like. I think we have to have more opportunities for our people to see each other. It's one thing to read about a country in a book. It's quite another to study there or visit there. Uh, Chinese students come here. We need American students to go there. We need to go back to the old high school exchanges. I know a lot of students who lived in Iowa for the first time from places because they were on high school exchanges. Uh, so I think we're going to do best uh, in that regard. Our athletes already are admired. Uh, our athletes there, their athletes here. Any way that we can find to get away from governments trying to uh, get to know each other and getting our people to know each other, it's going to benefit us in the long run. Haiti from Twitter asks, what do you believe is the future of educational visas for students coming mm -hmm. from the U.S.? 
Well, I hope that educational visas from the U.S. to China and China to the U.S. Uh, will multiply. Um, I am a very big believer in uh, student exchange. I think we learn about uh, countries not from books but by being there. And so, um, you know, I know that right now there is a lot of talk about whether we should be limiting uh, Chinese students coming to the United States. I just don't believe it. I think uh, that's not who we are. And uh, I hope one of, more of our students will take uh, Chinese language and, uh, and go and visit. I've been at the great Chinese universities. There are an awful lot of very good English speakers there. I hope one day we'll have as many good Chinese speakers here. Last question is, is somewhat of a commercial for the National Committee, because uh, we spend a lot of time trying to find outstanding young Americans yes. to go to China so yes. we can educate them. And obviously, in 1988, we made quite a selection yes. in selecting you. So the last question is, what impact did your participation in the National Committee's Sino-Soviet American Study Group have on your thinking about China, about its relations with the Soviet Union and the United States at the time? And was it helpful? in preparing you for your interactions with China as a government official? It, this trip was uh, life-changing for me. I'd been a Soviet specialist. I'd spent time in the Soviet Union. I'd never been to China. I didn't, don't know what I expected, but I saw a China that was already emerging as an entrepreneurial China. I remember the little stands with people selling things and thinking this place is changing. People were starting to wear colorful clothing, and I thought this is not the, the Mao jacket uh, in gray and blue that I learned of when I was studying comparative communism uh, as a student. I also got to see parts of China that most Americans don't see. We went up to the Sino-Soviet border, and we were in two little border towns, Suifenhe and Mudanjiang, were the mm. names of them. And a uh, very funny story. So my Chinese counterpart, um, foreign minister, uh, said, Yang Shishi, said to me, do you know that your picture is in a restaurant <laughs> in Mudanjiang? <laughs> And sure enough, from that trip young in 1980, Rice. there was young Condoleezza Rice on a picture. So it was an enormously uh, wonderful time and life-changing and keep doing it because we need to get young Americans to China. Uh, we need to get them there because, you know, you invest in people. And uh, I went on to become Secretary of State. Other people that you send there will go on to become uh, titans of industry, CEOs and the like. Some will become great professors and bring on the next generation. Some will become elected politicians. Uh, it's really important uh, at this time. There's a lot for us to do together. It's a hard time. We have a lot of differences. Uh, but I think that uh, we can work through them, but not if we don't know each other. And that's what the National Committee does. Thank you for that. Thank you for your incredible service to this country. It's not. really been an extraordinary and is still an extraordinary career. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank it's you. It's deeply appreciated. Thank you. And Steve. thank you all for joining us.